while getting strapping back into the saddle here. A little WD-40 to blow that uh, rust yeah. off. All right, I think we're good. Um, all right, let's get this party started. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Jared Kingston, back in the saddle here. Um, with uh, We actually got a full house today. Got Jackie with, with me, Dale. Dale's on, so we are bringing the full powerhouse today um, to kick off this June of MVP Office Hours. So, uh, Dale, Jackie, you guys want to say hi? Howdy, everyone. Hope that you're all doing great on this, uh, this Friday. It's raining here in Charlotte. You need it. Um, looking forward to today's interaction. So, welcome, everyone. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. It's uh, kind of hot here in Kansas City. So wherever you are, uh, happy June, happy summer. Or if you're in Southern Hemisphere, happy winter. But happy <laughs> to have you here. Awesome. Well, as we do with all the MVP officers, we'd like to kick off with just highlighting some events that are, are happening. There's certainly uh, some upcoming Salesforce events. Um, you know, look at your local user groups for, you know, Trailhead DX Global Gatherings that are going to be coming up. Um, also, there's a lot of Dreamin' events that are headed your way here uh, you know, very shortly with, uh, you know, down in uh, hot and steamy Austin, Texas for Texas Dreamin'. Um, and then uh, you're dreaming, I think that's said correctly, out in uh, Amsterdam you know, and all these other Dreamin's that are coming up. Uh, if, you, if these are in your area, we, we encourage you to check them out. Um, as you can see, this thing has just blown up um, across the, the world, really. I mean, I didn't even know there was a Czech Republic dreaming. That's crazy. Um, so, yeah, definitely check these out. Um, these are great events led by the community, um, usually with some, some Salesforce involvement on the, on the keynote. So check those out. And Jared, um, previously on this list was Banff out of Canada, and they have moved their event to next year. So, okay. um, yeah, it's it's not just missing; it's just been it's just been moved. So, awesome! All and right, shameless self promotion: Midwest Dream in Chicago, August. Please come. <laughs> That's right. And if anyone's going to be at Big Sky Dream out of Bozeman, Montana, I'll be out there. Come by and say hi. Nice. I just want to go there just to go to Montana. Really, uh, we we are making a vacation out of it post conference, so it'll be fun. But uh, if I remember, I'll bring stickers. So come say hi. Awesome. All right. Well, um, just to cover some quick ground rules, uh, as we always do, this. MVP office hours is all about everyone participating. It doesn't matter if you're an MVP or not. Um, we're, you know, share your experience, input, recommendations. Uh, we're here to help each other out. So, um, you know, all that we ask is it mute yourself so it's easy to hear people um, answer and ask questions. Um, if you have a question, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll ask you to just speak up. Um, if we're talking, just raise your hand within the meeting and we'll uh, get to you as soon as possible. Um, then, uh, you know, just to, uh, you know, it's always helpful to, you know, hear you say your name with, uh, as you introduce yourself. So announce yourself there. And uh, we use the chat to post resources, links, and we'll be recording those as we go and posting them out to uh, our group um, within the Trailblazer community. And if it gets down to it, we're not afraid to, you know, let you share your screen and, you know, show us what you're you're working with, if you will, and we'll we'll see if we can help from there. We record all of these um, and post them out to our YouTube channel, uh, which you know you can find uh, either going to YouTube and searching, or go to mvpofficers.info and it has a link there to all the recordings. Encourage you if you haven't already to subscribe to that channel um, and get the recordings directly to your inbox, which is pretty sweet. So. That being said, I think I covered it all. Let's get to the, um, yeah, MVPs. Do we have any MVPs in the house? I see. I know. Um, I see Pete on there. Look at another name, Stuart. Stu. Yep. 
Okay. Well, thanks, uh, thanks to those MVPs for joining and, and helping out. Always appreciate it. Let's jump into uh, the Q and A. You want to talk yeah. about the the global? Yeah, network? yeah, good. Yeah, so yeah. Before we jump in, real quick, um, just a reminder, right? We, we are a global group, right? So we have this U.S. group. We have one that's running over in EMEA. We also have uh, Carlos who runs uh, our Portuguese one. And if you're, you know, uh, either uh, in those areas or just, you know, have a passion for those areas, certainly um, you, you can jump on and help those calls out as well. Those times are listed on mvpofficehours.info. Um, and, you know, they're, they're great uh, opportunities to, to help. You know, I know Jackie always mentions like the Portuguese one is a great one and that you don't have to know how to speak uh, Portuguese. Carlos does a really great job of, of translating uh, where necessary. So um, yeah, great, great opportunity to help out. And again, all that is out at mvpofficehours.info. Um, all right, so Marty is quick to the, the hand raise. So Marty, you wanna kick us off with your question here? Hi, this is Marty. So this is an opinion best practice question. People who have experience, I'm in the midst of setting up a couple of customers with inbox and the opinion is Einstein activity capture sync versus lightning sync. Any pros, cons, comments? Ooh, hot opinions here. Well, I was just trying to get uh, back to it, the article. It, it has Einstein in the Mickey. name, so. Peter, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, it, it does have Einstein in the name, so I tend to prefer those things, but full disclosure, I've never worked with either. If, could you say more about what you're trying to deliver? I think there's a pretty clear difference between the two tools and their intended functionality. So what are you uh, what are you trying to accomplish at the end of the day? Well, good question. Different customers with different requirements, but and Salesforce is saying Einstein activity capture because that's the wave of the future, and all they care about at the moment is just having their salespeople be in their inbox, be it Outlook, Gmail, et cetera, and the easiest way to connect with <laughs> Salesforce as automatically as possible. So that's where I'm like, yeah. uh, and so I'm, in one case, I went Einstein activity capture um, that seems to be working fine. And I'm about to do another one. And I'm obviously this is a great place to get opinions. Um, so that's my question. Yeah, so I think Dale just brought up this link here and Stuart and I were um, on the same wavelength there um, and, and posted that in there. If you check out that link, it gives you the comparison, right, of what is what is included within each. Um, yeah, I would, you know, as, as Pete, uh, I think was saying there is, I mean, Einstein is most likely the the we have the future of this going forward, I would assume, um, for some of this setup. So um, I know, for instance, right, like Inbox, uh, for example, um, uses Einstein Activity Capture as a part of capturing those um, via the Inbox activity. So, uh, but yeah, this is a great link to view uh, here of, as far as what's included in the capabilities of each. This is Stuart. I, I think one of the, um, one of the questions that you may want to, uh, in summer 19 release, Salesforce did a lot of updates to the Einstein activity capture. And, um, for orgs that have it, they, they turned on um, some of the syncing on by default. 
So it, it appears to me, um, just kind of reading, this is all uh, safe harbor, what I'm going to say, is it looks like going forward, Salesforce may be doing more enhancements and uh, releases for the Einstein Activity Capture product. Um, that's not to say that they wouldn't do enhancements for the other product, but um, uh, you know, it looks like based on the release notes and that sort of thing that they're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of enhancements and uh, features for that uh, Einstein Activity Capture product. Yeah, that's, that's what I believe too. That's why I went in that direction. Thank you, everybody. Um, if I could add one thing to that, if your client is using uh, Einstein Analytics at all, I would say that that's another uh, reason to go with uh, Einstein Activity Capture because there's a pre-built template that allows you to get insights into those uh, and it spins up a, a data flow and some uh, analytics dashboards for you. Uh, I've been hearing people have been having some issues with replication on that, but it's relatively new. They'll work the kinks out of it as they go. Great, thank you. Awesome, all right, who else has a question? We don't have any questions if people have um, their favorite. Oh, there we go. I was going to say after we do that, if you guys want to talk about your favorite summer 19, um, that'd be a great discussion as well. Uh, so not a question so much as a shout out. Um, I was at the uh, hackathon for Einstein chatbots at University of Miami uh, this past Monday. And although the product's fairly new and I think it's, it's definitely got a ways to go, uh, it was really amazing how quickly we were able to spin up functioning chatbots. So imagine that you got that whole, um, you know, when you call into an automated system, it's like press one for this, and then it subdivides into a different menu. Now imagine a little chat window on your on your website, and it uh, it uses um, natural language processing to figure out what your customer is actually asking for, and then responds accordingly. It takes a little while to get it to, to, to train on the different permutations of what you can say to get it to respond. But what's really cool about it is that you're talking about an AI functionality that is clicks not code to set up. And then it can also tie into um, the invocable framework. So you can pass about variables and call Apex logic and then return those values back to the bots. You can also call flows and return values back to the bots. So for example, my team, uh, we had it querying some fields on the contact record to answer questions that the user had. Um, another team actually made their bot bilingual. Uh, so it's a really cool technology that I think has a lot of promise and definitely something to keep your eye on. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this is Jared. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I know we had an SE on my team did a, a workshop at the uh, the uh, mothership, if you will, and it was cool to see what came out of that. Right of just the the in depth, and I've done some other things with you know some support and stuff around chatbots. And yeah, I, I completely agree. It's I think we're just scratching the surface right now, and there's going to be some really awesome things coming down, especially just from being able to do a lot of this declaratively, right and building out this functionality um, will be super helpful um, as well as, you know, some chatbot templates, things like that, that, um, that are, are coming down the line. So um, yeah, plus one to that for sure. I haven't even seen, okay. Ooh, Pat and Squire. I don't You guys were both like, neck and neck so i'm just going to go with the top one um pat hey there hey there uh just had a question come up yesterday one of my customers uh trying to install my app uh, which the, my app uses um streaming api and and rest etc turns out they're on uh professional edition 
and they have not paid for the API enablement. Uh, does anybody have experience on that? I, I'm, I'm finding documentation that I can get my app, quote, whitelisted so that it will work even if they don't have that done, except there's, there's very little information about exactly what is required to do that. Has anybody gone through that before? Okay. I'll take that as a, as a no and uh, wait to hear back from Salesforce on it. Thanks. Pat, this is Jackie. One of the things you might do is check to see what other apps work uh, in um, professional and see if you can reach out to some of those, those folks for guidance. That's a good idea. Thanks. Yep. Squire, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, go for it, Squire. All right. Uh, so I, I'm kind of hoping that I just don't know about something. So we have um, a series of child objects connected to account, and we utilize uh, account uh, you know, parent accounts, and the ask is to be able to report at the parent all the records associated with that parent and the children. So I'm envisioning something along the line of like how opportunity forecasting will pick up the entire hierarchy and give you that output, but they want it at the record label. So I can't just write a unique re report type and say, go up and get the parent. It, it, I'm really looking for something that says the parent has some records, the children have some records, group them all together at the parent. Is there something that I haven't come across that I should be using to do that? I know a really dirty trick for this one. Okay. <laughs> Create a bunch of additional lookups and auto-populate them so that you, you can basically have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, uh, that's, you can that's also, my plan. <laughs> it's, you can also do kind of um, like an ultimate parent sort of uh, logic where you can say, you know, if parent ID is null, then account, you know, if parent dot parent dot parent dot parent, but you do kind of cap yourself off at the, at how far you can traverse that hierarchy. Yeah. Um, the, the ultimate parent formula uh, works real well for native reports, but not for a, like a embedded component where you have to filter for an ID because it doesn't actually find its way through the hierarchy. So that's why mm. I was looking for. So I think the I think the effectively a secondary parent lookup that says like these are all related to this parent, so I can write a native report type and just get me the the parent and the children and then the child records is is the only thing I could come up with. But I was secretly hoping there was something along that forecasting model that I could leverage. So it doesn't sound like you could also you could also potentially create a junction object that creates one like and I think this is a this is a terrible strategy but because um, <laughs> I mean it would it would just spam out so much data but let's right. say you have four layers in the hierarchy your child record would then create one junction for each of those four layers which would right. then multiply your data volume by the number of rows that you have in total and then additionally you would have kind of this this deduplication effort that you would need to do um, because your count of rows is going to be inflated so you would need like a formula field that basically says you know, give me one divided by the number of layers of hierarchy that I'm looking up through so that you would end up with a one when you summed that. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's no, I can't think of any clean solutions. Yeah. I was, like I said, I was hoping that there was some sort of out of the box thing I was forgetting about, but I think that the, uh, using a process to basically make like kind of a shadow parent relationship so I can write a native report type is the way to go. I just, just, just fingers crossed. So thanks Pete. Yeah, you don't have Einstein analytics, right? Uh, we do, but we need it quicker than the time it would take to put something like that into place. So, okay. Well, I mean, if you decide you want to go down that route, just you know, reach out to me offline because we, when we're in that environment, you know, I there really aren't any limitations. Right. Yeah, we've uh, we've got a, a roadmap of Einstein analytic dashboards that we want to write, uh, but it's probably more of like start of 2020. So we're trying to hit this one today kind of a thing so um but watch out for that email i'll be reaching out since today is national donut day there will there will be no references to cake in the call all references to desserts must be donut related thank you i second that <laughs> you 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 do not want us to oh, talk about cake <laughs> 
that what you're saying? <laughs> donut go there. Pie charts are no pie nut, pie charts are no longer supported. We now have donuts. <laughs> I love it. It's all yes. making sense why National Donut Day is the same month as June, the same month as Father's Day, because these are just a whole slew of bad dad jokes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's hilarious. Hey guys, I, I, I have a new, uh, one other minor thing. I, um, I'm writing a unit test, and I actually got this error. You can look at it in the, um, <laughs> in, in the chat window. The assertion failed even though the expected and the actual are exactly the same. So I can't quite figure out what I'm supposed to do about that. The, well, the expected says out, out. In the oh, rate. it's a typo. Ah, up, thank though. you. Thank you. Yep. Fresh eyes. Whew. Yeah. I do love that error. The, like I love, I think it's hilarious. Like fatal error is like so scary. You know, it's like, I know. Well, you know, actually, when I look at, at logs, I frequently uh, just go straight to the filter thing and type uh, in all caps FAT, just FAT, because it takes me right to the, the line in the code where it failed, you know. Mm. Out, out, opt out. Thank you. <laughs> Fresh eyes. Do you have any other questions or topics that you guys want to talk about? TDX was fun. Cool. What was your favorite thing? Yes, it was. Um, well, you know, it's funny. The, the first couple of years, I was, I was just so ravenous for uh, learning there. But this year, it was so focused on... Uh, DX and, and LWC in terms of the, the hands-on learning uh, classes. And I've been doing LWC for four months. So I, it wasn't really uh, uh, a lot to learn there. Um, I mean, f if you've been doing it, th there wasn't a lot of new stuff. So it was, um, I, I think my favorite, my actual favorite session was where they went through uh, debugging in VS code. Just, just how to actually do that and, I'm still struggling, but I'm getting there. Very cool. Anybody else? I saw a really sweet uh, demo on uh, Einstein as it relates to like uh, image recognition um in the einstein area it was pretty sweet that they were using an example of like wasn't anything crazy exciting but it was water heaters you know something most all of us can relate to um and it was an example of like taking a picture of a water heater or giving it to einstein um <laughs> Okay, Stuart, um, giving the picture uh, of that water heater to Einstein and it could basically recognize just off the, the picture alone what type of water heater it was, you know, based upon all this training data it had been given. Um, and it was pretty cool. The guy just went directly to Google and said, hey, just pick any water heater picture of just you know, one water heater. He uploaded it, and sure enough, it um, said, "Yeah, this, you know, eighty-four. You know, this. There's actually a. Uh, I'll post the link here in the the chat. There's actually an app on the App Exchange you can download um, that gives you the ability to kind of play around with this in the UI fashion. Um, uh, where's that? I'll post it in here." Um, but um, yeah, it was just really cool to see that in action. And on sure, the light, I'm not sure if anyone actually was listening because oh, of yeah, all the jokes. 
<laughs> in the chat. <laughs> if you guys do not have your chat window open, you need to open it because it's a great Friday laugh. Oh. Anyway, go ahead. No, here. Uh, <laughs> I was also going to say on the Lightning Web Components front, there's a, if you haven't seen, there's a nice sample gallery out there. I just posted that into the chat. It gives you some ones that uh, <coughs> Salesforce has provided that you can just put directly um, in your org. Some pretty cool ones in there. You know, speaking of uh, AI and image recognition, did you see the news? Uh, I saw this today that Microsoft has deleted the largest public face recognition data set that was in existence. They had uh, like 10 million, oh no, I'm sorry, 10 million images of 100,000 individuals, mostly celebrities, public figures, uh, that they were using for development of facial recognition and, and they were concerned about misuse of it and they've deleted it, which is not to say that it doesn't exist on thousands of other hard drives elsewhere, but just an interesting uh, uh, aspect of AI that we need to be thinking about. Interesting. You know, I remember when Einstein Analytics came out and I got a lot of pushback from clients that they wanted pie charts because donut charts didn't resonate to them. They, it, it had to be a pie chart. And I mean, for me, this was really just like very difficult to respond to because it's really, for me, it's more about the insights and not about the shape of the visualization. And, and so I had to come up with a lot of different ways to push back on this. And I said, well, you know, for one thing, actually, it basically is a pie chart, but in today's economy, we can't afford to give you the whole pie. So we just have to cut the middle out of it. Uh, and then my other one was, well, actually, it's not a pie chart at all. It's just a bar chart where we have stitched the bars end to end. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, you can't have a pie chart. You can have a donut chart. But at the end of the day, I actually did find one legitimate argument for why it is superior to the pie chart, and that is that it, it, it frees up real estate to put the total in the middle. So donuts are, in fact, superior empirically. <laughs> why donuts are better than pie. Donuts are better than everything. I don't know why we're even going to possibly open up the argument. I did a, a video for the Einstein Analytics Recipe Builder, but I, I might have done it on April Fool's Day. So it was just me in my kitchen making pizza. Mm -hmm. That catter app, uh, that catter batch was pretty sweet though, wasn't it? Yeah, I've actually seen clients requesting, you know, potential use cases for field service lightning. For example, um, that, I mean, the simplest example is a picture of a vending machine identifies which slots are empty and automatically adds that to the order that needs to go on the delivery person's truck. Um, but there's, you know, other applications where, uh, you know, for example, you could tie this with IOT. So let's say that you're in a factory setting, um, a valve in a big machine breaks the IOT sensor, puts in a support case. The guy goes out, he takes a picture and he logs what the damage to the part is, is. And then it compares that with what the picture of the working one is supposed to be. And then eventually over time, you could theoretically just have somebody be like, Hey, I don't know why this thing's not working. Let me take a picture of it. It could figure out what's actually wrong with it. And then, you know, put in all your orders for you. I imagine that that would take a long time to train, but when we, when we think about the art of the possible, like all this stuff is really starting to blend together. And I, I'm, a, I'm very suspect when I hear the term AI at all, but they're starting to make a believer out of me as far as, is it marketable? Is it actually worth what we're investing into it? And are we going to get that ROI out of it? And I'm starting, I'm, I am starting to see it bear fruit. So it's really cool to, it's a really great time to be in this business. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the things that they were talking about this booth as he was talking through the demo was that similar thing where it could over time, 
learning data about, you know, even like big machinery, right? And know what individual parts are a part of that piece of machinery and be able to look at a picture and say, oh, you know, this part is missing or this part looks wrong or you know, something is, is off there, be able to identify that you know, from that picture, um, which would be, yeah, crazy, right? Like, oh, what part is this? Oh, well, let me take a picture and you know, upload it here and it could basically identify all those parts and so you could find the part you need um, right in the field is pretty, pretty crazy to think about. What else do we have? Anybody else want to throw out a question or? Maybe just one for the group uh, with the with the ongoing push of lightning components being kind of the, the dev centric way to do things. Does anybody have any non trailhead resources that they like to recommend to people who are trying to get up to speed? I have a couple myself, but I'd like to hear more. Uh, I am always uh, pinging over to W3 schools, I think it was called. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that's, that, that, that seems to be the, the clearest uh, place for JavaScript uh, reference, JavaScript functions, CSS especially. I saw a lot of this being are starting to get replicated into the LWC documentation too. You're seeing like kind of the Salesforce versioned uh, uh, descriptions of some of these things. Um, and I, I've gotten a lot of good feedback from things like Pluralsight and uh, ah, what's the other free one? Uh, I've lost it. There's another on, online the, free. The Khan, uh, Khan Academy? Have you been? Uh, it's not that one, but that? I think that one's pretty good too. Yeah, uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it Code School, Code Academy? There's another free one too, but yeah. So, yeah. Um, does anyone have experience with anyone that they really would recommend over the anything else? Plural site is free this weekend, starting today. Yeah, I love Plural site. If you don't have a, if you haven't had a chance to dive in, it's it's a great time to give it a shot. And you can get uh, what is it? 20 hours free or something anytime and then decide if you want to keep it. Hmm. I will say that the uh, LWC recipe site that they've created and are continuing to refine uh, is maybe the best developer resource I've, I've found that, that Salesforce has created. It really uh, lays it all out and provides code and uh, it's completely integrated with, uh, with Git and uh, VS Code. So it's, it's really a great resource. Yeah, and the playgrounds are really fun too, especially if you just are kind of poking around, you don't have time to spin something up. You can just go to town on the playgrounds. I, I guess I haven't I haven't used that feature on the on the um, on the component reference. You know the the playground thing there. It, it's I I I like it just because you know I'm coming from um, you know very apex centric world trying to catch up with LWC and being able to just open one up and just play around with the with the. Uh, yeah. lines and see what the impact is without really having to try to wire anything together is is really enlightening when you're kind of starting from scratch. Yeah, although I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, local development. Did, did you see this announcement? Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so you know, you'd be able to, to work without actually even pushing to a scratch work. It, it just, I mean, it would just be local work. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, there was a there was a pretty dramatic cheer from my developer team uh, about an hour ago when they were when they heard about it in uh, in uh, Salesforce Live. Yeah.
Uh, I got a pretty cool and really simple clicks not code hack if you guys wanted to see something. Uh, I showed this to the uh, Charlotte user group a couple of weeks ago. Basically, like, what if yeah, you have right. a validation rule, but you don't want to stop people from saving the record? If you want, I can, I've got the org open. I can show you. Sure. <laughs> All right. So uh, here's our use case uh, in my org. You know, we prefer to have clean data. You know, we would like it if our probabilities are aligned to the stage that they're supposed to be in. Uh, but, you know, we do allow users to change the probability because you never know. We don't want to put a hard blocker on them not being able to change that. But we would like to tell them, hey, maybe you're doing it wrong. So uh, first, I'm going to flick this off right here because I still have this set to the way it was when, when we finished. So I've got a normal opportunity page right here. And the first and easy way to do this is I've created a formula field. Um, I've got a, a formula field in place that basically tells me if my probability is not aligned to what the probability for my current stage should be. So clicks not code, don't even need to write a flow. All I do is just drag a rich text field over here. And I make myself a big red error message. And then I add a filter to this for component visibility. And basically, probability aligned equals false. So if the probability is not aligned, then I want to see the big red error. Otherwise, I don't want to see it. And, and something like this is so easy to do. No, you don't need to understand flows. You don't need to, to, to be able to code nothing. Uh, it's as easy as creating a validation rule. So now all I've got to do is set this probability to something that doesn't match what the stage is supposed to be at, and I get my big red error. Now, we notice this other component popped up here too. The reason for this is because, well, this big red error doesn't necessarily give me enough context to know how to fix it. So for example, what if I did that by mistake? What if I, I, I was just like, oh, what does this field do? I deleted the probability out of it. I don't know what I'm supposed to set it back to. And now this big red error won't go away. And I feel like I've just broken Salesforce. So what I've got going on here is just an extremely simple flow that queries the record, figures out what information is relevant to the user, and actually displays that to them so that we can have a dynamic error message. So basically, it's just telling me this is what my current probability is, and this is what my suggested probability is. And a flow like this is so easy, it spins up in a matter of minutes because we're not actually doing any like true programmatic logic. We're just querying a record, pulling a couple of fields off of it, and making a, a simple little text string. So I can show the flow for this one right here. And let's see, probability alert. Yeah. See, this is about as simple of a flow as you can literally get. So all it does is we are querying an opportunity where my ID equals opportunity ID. And I have to set this variable to receive input. Um, and this is just like when you, when you create the variable, you just have to set it to, you have to check this available for input checkbox. That's going to allow you to, to let the lightning page pass the record ID into the flow. So the flow knows now, oh, go and get the opportunity that the user is currently looking at. And then all we have to do is basically say, grab some fields off of that and fill it in. And it uses the same syntax as, uh, it uses the same syntax as like a, an email template. So I think this is a really, really great hack, um, especially for, you know, because in the past, how would we have to do this? Uh, we would do a pop-up with like, you know, a, a toast or a visual force modal pop-up thing. But now we've overridden our detail. Like if, it in, if we're talking about in Salesforce Classic, we've now overridden our detail page with a visual force page, which means anytime we want to do something extremely simple, like move the amount field to the other side of the page, we now have to go and call a developer to achieve this extremely simple basic requirement that a lot of businesses ask for. And we usually just have to politely say, well, no, you can't have that. Well, here it is, soft warnings in moments. All right, that's, what, that's all I got. <laughs> hey, that's, uh, that's a good one, uh, Pete. Pete? Uh, go, don't, go. Leave, don't leave Pete. 
<laughs> oh no, I'm I'm still here. I'm just not screen sharing anymore. Uh, I can um, turn the screen share back on. Did you want yeah, to do something specific? Yeah, I wanted to ask you something about that that big red button or the big red error. So, um, can you? Uh, hopefully, these are simple questions from a simple person. Um, can you make that big red error appear? Perhaps if the close date is before yesterday, will it will it work on so, things like date? What what I want to do is force my salespeople to see in bright red letters that you are past your due date. Let's find out. And and then I have a follow up question to this. So this should work on date fields. At the bare minimum, you could have a formula field that goes boolean true false, and then have the component read the boolean true false. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I could put a formula yeah, field and but, saying, but show me the, show me the number it in the component. D days days past close date or something like that, and then say if that's greater than one, then then that's uh, then that turn that on. Okay. Yeah. That's easy. Yeah. So it. It's looking like it doesn't support date fields out of box. So yeah, okay. you would need to go with the formula field approach, but uh, you can definitely do that. And then with, if you additionally wanted to use the flow technique, then you can specifically tell them this opportunity is X number of days past due. You can actually start warning them out like a week in advance and let the message get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, it's a lot easier to do in the summer 19 release now that we have the uh, rich text editor back in flows. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I like that idea. Hey, hey Pete, this is Dale. So I have a, I have a question. Maybe I missed the, the initial walk in into this for why this hack bite. Um, is this to override validation rules or like what's, I, I guess no, the, this is, I, the, the negative I, place that my head goes to is that validation rules are intended to enforce business requirements. And so, yeah, so this is, this is more of a soft stop because I've had business use cases where we don't want to block a user from doing things. So for example, one of my clients, um, they staff medical providers. And if you want to staff someone at the standard rate, that's fine. If you want to staff somebody at, you know, 10% more than everybody else that gets that job, you can do that, but it's going to need to go through like six additional layers of approval, which is going to delay the process. We don't want to stop you from doing the thing, but we want to let you know, hey, you're deviating from the recommended path and that this is potentially going to cause problems for you, but that it is permissible within the business. But I, I guess what's, what's enforcing, what's enforcing the record to ultimately end up back in the ideal business process path. That's what I'm missing with this. Does it? No, uh, nothing because that's, that's the <clears throat> thing is it's, it's a soft warning. A validation rule means is, is meant to stop you dead in your tracks. Right. So uh, another example would be, maybe we want to enforce quality of information. So we don't want to let you get to stage, we, we have a validation rule that says you can't pass into stage three until all of these different fields are filled out. But we don't want to throw 15 errors at you when you go to stage three. When you get to stage one or two, we want to tell you what you're missing that you're gonna to need to do before you can progress this forward. So it can also be used as kind of a preemptive strike uh, because something a problem that we have internally is that we kind of have that scenario where once things start to move past like I mean you can put a prospect in and say like yeah maybe this is going to be a thing and we don't need a ton of information but if you're going to try to move this up to like a 50 percent probability or higher we want to enforce the strictness of quality of information so that we can follow our due diligence and make sure that our forecasting is actually right because now we're going to start reaching out to that client and, and trying to move this thing forward so then they get a million validation rules and they're like, w w why didn't somebody tell me I was going to have to fill all this stuff out? And I don't even know who I'm supposed to go find it from. So the idea is to bring information to the user's attention as soon as possible, but not stop them dead in their tracks. Maybe we'll let them save the record in a draft state when it's incomplete, but we're not going to let them push it through the pipeline until then. So this, this you know, another, another good thing that you can do for this is like the, the whole are you sure thing. And then you can check a box that says, are you sure? But it's just a way to, to prompt the user that, hey, this is less than perfect and we would prefer you not to do this, but not stop them dead in their tracks. Here, here's another thing I love, Dale. Uh, I love about this is, um, say you're at a client that is not ready for 
Einstein uh, opportunity scoring or account scoring, but they have their own sort of internal way of, de of detecting if this account needs help or opportunity needs help based on some simple formula fields or, or something about the account fields. They can now, using this, um, what, what Pete's showing here, they can show some insights on the page based on something that's happened on a field on the account or on the opportunity and give sort of a, an Einstein sort of feel without having Einstein. No, I get, I get all of, all of that, all of what's going on. My question is, is does this then come with some kind of enforcement back to the user that, I mean, you've just committed a record to the database. Does this then come with some kind of a practice back to the users that says at some point you're going to have to clean up your data to meet business process requirement. Mm. That's my question. I get how validation rules work. I get what this flow is, is intended to do. I also see that it's committing a record to the database to then move on and be updated by anybody else, potentially with gaps in information. So that's what I'm wondering is mm -hmm. what reconciles this in the end? No, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and but but a lot of times I'm I you know I'll give a, a best practice recommendation to my client and they'll just say well no, hmm. um, you know uh, another thing is what if it's based on the results of a formula output uh, so for example you know that opportunity is now in the past I mean we can fire off a notification if we want but we can't block them from you know we can't do anything about the record other than through reporting and notifications to say that this thing already happened. It wasn't through a user's action. It was a, through a user's inaction. Another example would be, um, you know, customer calls up to, to order something, big red pop-up on the account that says expired credit card. So maybe before you take their order, you should resolve that issue. <coughs> but no, I do definitely agree uh, that, and I don't like, what I don't like about this sort of stuff is that it does kind of open up the client to the idea that we don't really need to enforce anything. And they, you know, it's, it's a lot better. I think when you tell them, Hey, if you want to start allowing dirty data into your system and you want to have this soft warning to do it, it's going to cost you a ton of code because then they'll think, you know, about the, the, the heavy mm. price tag of dirty yeah. data. And, and you kind of do open up the door to, to laziness. But my thing is, you know, I, when I was faced with the, the challenge of, hey, we, we, want, we want this functionality, I had to say to myself, well, am I going to have to, you know, grab one of my developers and nobody's on the bench right now, or can I figure out a way to get this done? And it was like, oh, component visibility. And I, I, it's just, I think that that feature uh, kind of slipped past the radar for a lot of people, and it's super powerful. Even something like, I only want, uh, I, I want the, the sales leadership to have access to a flow but I don't want the sales reps to see that flow, but I don't want to deal with multiple page layouts, different record types, different app pages, all that whole thing, you know, cause it, it gives me a smaller footprint. You know, if I've only got everything on one app page with component visibility, I can still have a much more manicured experience because I can do something like profile contains boss and selectively choose what components I'm going to render for them. And I can have a very customized user experience without having to build out 15 different versions of the page. So then I'm not creating that tech debt of when I go to add a fancy new report chart I, that I want everybody to see, I still only have one place I've got to add it. So if, if we're finished talking about that, I have a, a flow related question uh, for Pete because you seem to be the flow master. Um, I'm, I'm getting a, a strange error. And by the way, I've, I've filed a support ticket on it and they've, they've escalated it twice because uh, they can't figure it out either. But I just thought you might have seen this before. It's a lightning out error when the flow runs, uh, but the, the flow runs fine. I mean, it functions completely fine. It just shows me, it prints it here. I'll show you. Can I share my screen? Uh, here, let's share this. Uh, it's a flow that runs from a, a list. Basically, it can be any list, but in this case, it's leads. So let me just select a, a, some leads. And I launch the flow. It's basically creating new records from these records. 
launches this flow, pulls in the IDs of the selected records, uh, and gives me this at the bottom. This is not part of the flow right there. Uh, it still works fine. I can add this to this. I click next. This is pulling in an aura uh, component that gives me a, a pop-up. I click next. It tells me it was created and I hit finish and I'm done. But, and this is the flow. It calls Apex. If I had to guess, that was, yeah, if I had to guess, it's going to be something to do with the Apex because <clears throat> I, think, I think that error is going to be related to the fact that you're embedding a lightning component into your screens. Uh, I've, I've, well, oh, so, so not the Apex node, maybe. Well, so, so there's an Apex node and then there's a lightning node. Uh, however, I've deconstructed this thing and, and I cannot isolate it to, to either one of those elements. Uh, you know, I what about the browser debug logs? Because I've seen I've seen times where something won't necessarily throw an error, but like it'll still appear to be functioning, but something's grinding behind the scenes. And uh, sometimes you can pick that up in like the browser uh, console, like F12 or whatever that is. Yeah, oh, and I I don't know how to do it on a Mac. Well, so I've got it open, uh, but I don't. <laughs> So other than the console log things that I stick in here, I don't really, I'm not very uh, efficient at knowing where to look for what in here. Is, is it elements or where do I go? Uh, <clears throat> I was seeing some red error messages on that first page there. We could try to read those and see if they make any sense. Uh, those message on, uh... Is logo eighty something that, no, that's probably, no. Something out of the box. No. It's amazing how many errors a page can actually throw and still like oh, appear yeah. to work just fine. Yeah, I, I kind of don't, except for the ones that I, I put in there, console errors or, or console log stuff, uh, you know, the rest of this stuff is kind of. Uh, well, one of them, it says uh, uncaught, if you go back to that, one of them says uh, like the third one from the bottom above those two runtime last errors, that one says it failed to execute post message on window, and that is linking to, and uh, it says Visual Force JS library, or a Aloha frame navigator. So I think, I'm, I'm thinking whatever it's mad about, it's mad about your lightning component. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea. Okay. I don't know. So support kit quite figure it out either. One, one thing that is, is cool in this, it's sort of an undocumented feature that I found, is that you can actually pass to a flow the list of selected records. Do you know was that? Was it you that linked me to the blog post on that? Um, there was yeah. a blog post on that in the workflow automation group recently. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's, I, I did find it on a blog post, but basically if you select this and you know uh, launch a flow, in the flow all you have to do is have uh, a variable, a collection variable for text called IDS. You just name it the right thing and make it available for input and it pulls in the IDs of the selected records. Yeah, that's a really cool hack. Yeah. Yeah, I'm inclined to think it's gotta be the lightning component, but at, now we've walked thoroughly outside of my domain. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's what I thought initially uh, first. But then I took it out and saved it, and the error was still there. So I don't know. Someone just posted a link to uh, a Stack Exchange question for the same thing. Yeah, it said to eliminate it and save it um, and then put it back in. But it sounds like that's what you just did. So I, I, Yeah, I did. Uh, any other error? I'm, I'm, uh, let's see. Did I stop sharing my? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's my question. Oh, it's yours. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I, I posted this there a couple of days ago. Yeah. That would be, or actually, yeah, so this is, this is a while back, a couple, couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, and, and support's been working on this for, for 10 days, trying to escalate it, and nobody can see, seem to figure out what it is. Looks like we've got about five minutes left. That was some really great discussion, you guys. 
Anybody else have a, a last minute question? Need a resource? Looking for some sprinkles for your donuts? Jared or Dale, do you guys have anything you want to share? I'm surprised there was no discussion of the new the, the new mascot. Have you seen that? Who's the new mascot? Oh, Ruth, the technical architect. Uh, yeah. She's an elephant. Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yep. Neil. Ruth, that technical architect is an elephant, you said? Yeah, there he is on the left in the images. Yep, well, that's not a forest animal. Well, it depends. Are, are we moving? Moving? Uh, well, neither is mule saw, muley, the mules, whatever the mule is. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, no, me. <laughs> No. So you find it's foresty, right? They're, they're, yeah, exactly. There are Asian forests, and that's that appears to be. That I guess is true. Yeah, I believe, I believe Ruth is Asian, not African. I I can you know gotta look at the ears, but pretty sure. She can dwell in whatever habitat she wishes. I guess so. That's right. Whatever her pronouns. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, thanks for sharing. Didn't know we had a new mascot. Mm -hmm. I guess those are the things you learn at Trailhead DX. No, actually, I learned that one after they. I saw it after it, it was over. Yeah, oh, I mean, okay. it, yeah, it's introduced here on the thirtieth. That was after, I think. Super cool. Also, have the new little kind of streamlined uh, trailhead logo and font yeah. there. Yeah, fancy. Does that mean we all get new hoodies now? You know, <laughs> yeah, there's a there's an application form. Somewhere. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't wear any of the hoodies that they give us because I, I wear my glasses most of the time hanging on my shirt collar, you know, when I'm not, when, when they're not on my face and, and the zippers <laughs> on those hoodies are metal zippers and they scratch my glasses. You need some bubble wrap. You can wrap. always send them my way. I, I've only got seven hoodies, so, you know, I need to stock up. <laughs> the, the hoodies I wear, are, you've got plastic zippers, so, I don't know, whatever. All right. Awesome. Any, anybody else have anything in the next two minutes you want to share? Anybody else going to NorCal Dreaming? It's going to be a good one. Having grown up in Sacramento, I would love to, but nope, not this year. No, Sacramento, end of June. It's going to be lovely. I I know, but uh, it's not in the cards right now. Yeah. Oh, uh, one one thing I will say quickly, uh, just put, there's been a lot of talk on uh, LinkedIn and some of the forums, et cetera, about the, there's a glut of people that are going through the training. Salesforce is, is getting a lot of people, you know, to ranger status and getting them certified and then they hit the job market and get stuck because they've got no Salesforce experience on their resume. And so uh, to those of you with experience who are doing any hiring, I just want to put out the word. It's important to hire people with no Salesforce experience who have a cert and have demonstrated their trailhead experience. We got to, got to do something about the glut of people coming in because uh, they'll never start filling the positions with two and three years. If we don't get them into positions with no years of experience. Well, we, we actually have a guy here in Kansas City, uh, Daniel Malone. If you're not following him on LinkedIn, because uh, I don't think he's made his way to Twitter yet, but go find him on LinkedIn. But uh, he is a gentleman who uh, kind of in the same mold as Zach Otero, same part of the country and everything, who came in from the outside and uh, heard about it from family, worked to get his cert. And the biggest thing that we were telling him in Kansas City is go find nonprofits um, and get your experience that way. And well, he, he is now, uh, he just posted something on LinkedIn a day or two ago that talked about like, I mean, you could tell he was geeking out when he wrote the post about what he had the opportunity to do as a declarative admin with lightning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's at least what, um, uh, we recommend if you need yeah, to well, you know, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's the standard thing, except that so many people here in the Bay area, 
uh, are swamping all of these these uh, nonprofits. And frankly, when it comes time to to be hired, the nonprofit experience doesn't actually transfer over to to the the job duties, and so they're finding it less and less valuable. So, I just one of the things that I've done, I've added what I'm calling a ranger apprentice uh, uh, with a full developer title, uh, and uh, she will be working with me uh, alongside me. I'm, I'm mentoring her as a developer because she wants to be a developer. She's certified as a developer. She's trained, but you know. She's getting the experience through me and, you know, the salary is, is commensurate with that. So just trying to encourage others to, to do the same. That's great that you're doing that, Pat. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, we are at time. Uh, I appreciate uh, all the collaboration, obviously the, the throw of new ideas and, and, and sharing that was done. Um, always appreciate that. Um, great call today. Appreciate everyone's time. Again, we'll post this recording, um, all the resources that we've gathered here um, out to the group uh, as well as on Twitter. So thanks everybody for joining MVP Office Hours and we will see you on the next one. Have a great weekend.